Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the results presentation for characterizing particle size distribution and trash and stormwater runoff from Ohio's roads. Today's presentation will be given by Ryan Winston of The Ohio State University, and he worked on the project for the entire duration. Um, please mute your phones if you are joining via phone or make sure your computer microphone is muted if you're joining through your computer. Any questions for the presentation can be held, should be held until the end of the presentation and we'll address some, the questions at that time. The final report and fact sheet for the presentation will be available on the research website, ODOT's research website and it will also be published in a national database. And with that, I'll let Ryan go ahead and get started. Perfect, thank you Kelly, and good morning everyone. Um, as Kelly said, my name is Ryan Winston, I'm an assistant professor um, at Ohio State University here in Columbus. Uh, good morning to those of you all who are here in person and then those of you all who are um, joining us via the World Wide Web. Um, so today we're gonna talk, uh, think about some interesting work that we've uh, collected data on over the last three years related to stormwater runoff here in Ohio, and particularly about uh, trying to understand the solids that are carried by stormwater runoff uh, as it flows off of roadways. So uh, just a quick outline, uh, we'll talk about some background on road runoff, a uh, bit of a problem definition, so why are we collecting the data, what are we trying to understand. Um, and then we'll really get into the, the brunt or the, the mass of the project here, which is related to uh, field monitoring and data analysis related to both um, sediments. So we'll talk about total suspended solids, uh, particle size distribution, which is trying to understand how big all of the particles are uh, in the runoff. Um, so from silt, uh, sand, clays, et cetera. And then uh, we'll talk about gross solids or, or trash and debris. Um, these are typically particles that are greater than a quarter inch um, in diameter. So you can imagine all of the different things that might come off a road that are that, are that size. Um, and, and then at that point, we'll really end um, the discussion of the data that we collected uh, at Ohio State and here with, with ODOT. And we'll really go into um, more of a literature review, um, sort of compiling a bunch of data and trying to understand um, how manufactured treatment devices function for TSS removal. Um, and TSS removal is particularly important because um, ODOT's NPDES permit requires um, an 80% capture of total suspended solids. So that's the threshold that we'll really be looking at uh, in this presentation. So just a bit of background on stormwater runoff. Obviously, as we develop and we create impervious surfaces, uh, we remove vegetation and, and sort of harden our landscape. Um, it reduces infiltration, we get more runoff. Um, so that's one portion of the sort of negative consequences of, of urbanization on, on stormwater. And then the other part is we get uh, additional pollutants or different pollutants potentially picked up as stormwater runs off of uh, these impervious surfaces. So things like oils and greases, um, nutrients, heavy metals, um, and then the latter two are the ones, as I mentioned earlier, that we're really gonna focus on here. So. Uh, sediment, and then uh, trash and debris, or what we term gross solids, uh, sort of the uh, term that has been carried over from wastewater treatment. Uh, so runoff impacts, the biggest impact, the most obvious one here in Ohio, if you want to think about stormwater runoff, mainly from agricultural fields, um, are the algal blooms in Lake Erie in, in northwest Ohio. Um, this can lead to things like fish kills. Habitat loss can occur from both the runoff hydrology side of things as well as um, different water quality problems. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of different um, issues that can occur from stormwater runoff here um, generally. Uh, if we want to talk about road runoff specifically, um, we have some uh, sort of specific pollutants that occur in road, run road situations. So this picture on the right is a typical Jersey barrier on an interstate highway and you can see kind of the sediment and debris accumulation, um, vegetation as well as vehicular parts um, from accidents. There's all sorts of um, different, different things that accumulate and might then be picked up as, as water runs off. Um, so highway specific pollutants include things like abrasion of um, brake pads and tires, um, combustion of fuel, so that leads to atmospheric deposition of pollutants, so pollutants just settling out of the air onto the road surface. Um, and then degradation of the road surface as, as itself from the, the vehicular traffic as well as things like plowing uh, in the wintertime. 
So uh, as far as pollutants of concern go, uh, the big one for ODOT that they're really interested in is TSS. This is a lumped parameter. It's one number that you get back from a particular water sample. The higher the number, the more sediment is in that sample, the cloudier the water, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and this particular analysis lumps all, uh, all sediment from 0.45 micrometers to 2 millimeters, which is basically the whole range of clay up to the biggest sand. Uh, trash is another um, pollutant. There's a couple of TMDLs across the country, uh, not here in Ohio, um, but again, typically these are uh, particulates greater than a quarter inch uh, in size. Obviously, there's aesthetic negatives to having trash in your, in your water. Um, there's potentially public health impacts as well. Um, so this is just a quick uh, guide for particulate matter in stormwater. Uh, you can see that on the left we have our smallest particles, on the right the largest. Um, so dissolved solids are those that are less than 2 micrometers, so very, very small. Uh, between 2 and 75 micrometers are the silts and clays, and that 75 micrometer is the 200 sieve, for those of you who live in, in sieves in your head. Between 200 sieve and the 4 sieve is your sort of your sands and gravels, um, and then larger than the 4 sieve is where we really break off um, for our, our gross solids. Um, and in the middle of the slide here, um, I'm going to use the laser pointer. You can see the sizes in inches. So we're talking about very, very small particles here on the left um, and moving to uh, larger particles on the right. Um, so I'm going to talk, there's, on the bottom of the slide here, there's a bunch of different ways to categorize uh, particle sizes. I'm going to use the USDA classification for sand, salt, and clay uh, throughout this presentation, but there is an AASHTO classification and others uh, that are out there for engineering classification of sizes of particles. So why study particulates for ODOT? Uh, the particular reason is permit compliance, right? We're trying to hit that 80% TSS removal target. Um, and in most of ODOT's right-of-way, this is a relatively, it's an easy thing to do, right? There's a lot of space. There's a ditch and, and vegetated side slopes that are going to probably provide you all or most of that 80% removal, right? Uh, but when you get into a space-constrained uh, right-of-way, think like I-70 uh, through I-670 through Columbus here, um, there's really not a lot of space for uh, BMPs or best management practices on the surface to treat stormwater runoff. So uh, often ODOT and others will move in these space-constrained sites to underground manufactured treatment systems. Um, and these, are, these, these systems generally, uh, for hydrodynamic separators, which we'll, which we'll talk about in just a second, generally capture particles greater than um, 75 micrometers well, and below that, uh, maybe not so well. So there's a qualified products list that uh, engineers can go to um, when they're working on a NODOT project to specify a manufactured treatment system uh, when an above ground uh, BMP is, is, not, um, is not financially um, feasible. So there's a, the product list currently is 21 devices. There's uh, five of them listed here, so there's 16 others that I haven't listed. Um, and they're all currently hydrodynamic separators. Um, and I'll talk about a hydro, what, how a hydrodynamic separator works in the next um, slide. It's basically um, using settling to drop out sediment and trash from the water. So here's an example of a typical hydrodynamic separator. It's a big cylinder that's placed in the ground. Uh, there's a manhole cover here at the top right here, um, which can be used for maintenance. So basically you drop a vector truck boom down in here and suck out the accumulated sediment and debris in the bottom of this system. Um, and so let me get my animation going here. So what happens as the water comes in as it rains um, and there's particles entrained in that water, right? There, we've picked up sediment and trash um, in the water. Water typically swirls in the bottom and then the sediment and trash accumulates there um, at the bottom of the structure and the clean water, my animations will go, there we go, the clean water then um, comes up and out and either goes out to the uh, surface water body that this drains to or out into the storm sewer network. So we have cleaner water coming out than, than what comes in. So that's the basic processes behind a hydrodynamic separator. For these manufactured treatment devices, um, the approvals or the testing of these devices to show whether they work is typically done in a laboratory setting. Okay? Um, and most of the uh, national guidance is actually based on a New Jersey DEP standard, um, so their Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and they've kind of set the standards which have become understood to be the nationwide uh, basis for uh, acceptance of these systems. Okay? Um, and so they, they used to use these two particle size distributions on the right, which are basically silica sand. So these ones here, these are no longer in use. Um, and you can see that they're very coarse uh, particle size distributions. So again, 
That 75 micrometer level right about here um, is where these hydrodynamic separators work well, bigger than that, and you can see the vast majority of this particle size distribution is bigger than that 75 micrometer level. The current particle size distribution that's used by NJDEP in their lab testing is this blue one here, um, which is much more uh, widely distributed across the silt, sand, and clay fraction. So we get a, um, a much, much broader um, distribution of sediment um, in, in those tests. So our basic question um, in this particular, um, so let me move back here a second. So if we're trying to get 80% TSS removal, we want to remove everything uh, bigger than the 20th percentile. Um, if we were to use the silica sand, we're up around a 90 micrometer value. If we were to use the NJ DEP value, we're around eight micrometers. And that's a huge difference as far as what BMPs we're going to select. If you're down at eight micrometers, you're really, you've moved past sedimentation and you're into filtration, okay? So the basic question, what we wanted to answer on the PSD particle size distribution side of this study is, does Ohio's stormwater uh, PSD look more like sand distribution or does it look more like the blue NJDEP distribution? Okay. Um, so I just want to touch on a couple of other manufactured uh, treatment devices that are out there. Uh, we talked about hydrodynamic separators, which are in the middle here. These are credited with 50% removal through the NJCAT testing, through the New Jersey testing. On the left, we have cartridge filters. These are essentially um, vaults that are put underground that have um, media filters in them that um, basically filter out the sediment and pollutants in that, in that fashion. And through the uh, lab testing, those get 80% TSS removal, which is, again, the, um, the criteria here for the ODOT permit. And then catch basin inserts um, typically are used for gross solids, um, and I'll show you an example of some that we built for this particular study. So why does particle size matter? Uh, really, it matters for predicting how fast particles settle out of water. Um, so this is Stokes law for particle settling. The settling velocity is the left-hand term here in this particular equation. And it's related to a number of factors that are essentially constants, right, uh, within the range of what we typically see in stormwater. So the viscosity of water, gravity, uh, the density of water, all those are going to be uh, typically relatively constant. What's not constant is the diameter of the solid, right? So as, because this is a squared term, the diameter of the solid, as it gets larger, it, it settles out much, much more quickly, okay? So small particles settle out more slowly than, than our large particles. So what we can then do is use this settling velocity, which we calculated on the last, um, last slide, the, the denominator of the right hand, or of the equation here. Um, and if we know in a BMP how far the particle has to settle, or the X subset, um, we can then calculate how long we have to hold the water in order to remove that particle or have it drop out of, um, of solution, okay? So if we were to do these calculations, um, which Ferreira and Sendstrom did a few years back in water environment research, um, you can see particle diameter here on the x-axis, so small particles on the left, very, very small particles on the left, very large particles, sand-sized particles on the very far right, and then removal efficiency on the y-axis, um, so 100% removals at the top of the graph here. What you can see is that um, with sand-sized particles out here on the right-hand side of the graph, we really only need to hold these particles on the order of a few seconds in order for them to drop out, okay? Maybe 10, 20 seconds. As we move into the silt range, we're in the order of maybe 10 or tens of minutes, and then as we move into the clay range, we're into multiple dozens of hours, okay, that we would need to hold the water. So basically what we we're trying to find here is what best management practices do we need to meet these required hydraulic retention times based on the field measured particle size distributions that I'm going to get to in just a second. Okay, so the objectives of the study broadly were really to characterize particle size distributions and total suspended solids in road runoff across Ohio. We did this at 12 different sites, as I'll show you in just a second, distributed uh, widely, spatially across the state. We collected gross solids um, from road runoff at 11 of the 12 sites. Um, in a different catch basin than where we collected the particle size distribution, so it was not the same um, watershed area. Uh, we measured bulk volume and mass as well as characterized nine different categories of gross solids, as I'll mention in just a second. And then the final thing was the sort of literature review that I mentioned, which is understanding how, how these MTDs function under Ohio's conditions based on the data that we collected in the first two bullets of this slide. 
Okay, so where were the 12 sites located? This is obviously uh, the state of Ohio um, with the annual average rainfall here um, across the state. The yellow dots that you see were the monitoring locations. So we had uh, two here in Franklin County, one in Delaware County, one in the, the northeast suburbs of Cincinnati, a couple in Dayton, a couple in Lima, a couple in Kent and Portage County, and then a couple in Lake County. So you can see broad spatial vari variation here. Um, we really, I think, did quite well in terms of hitting the entire state uh, for our data collection. 2016 monitoring sites, um, you can see here, we had really a very wide range of annual average daily traffic. The two Columbus sites were interstates, um, north of 100,000 vehicles per day. Um, the Delaware County site was adjacent to the, the, the zoo, and it was uh, less than 10,000 vehicles per day. So again, a very wide variability in annual average daily traffic. We had different functional classes. So when we were choosing these sites, we were really trying to get a wide variety in road characteristics so we could try to understand how that affected PSD and gross solids and TSS and all of those types of things. 2017, there's, here's some pictures here. Um, we had a few sites that were more rural. So the two Lima sites were, were, were sort of rural, and the I-90 site um, was, was where I-90 crosses the Grand River in, in, in uh, Lake County, so quite rural out that way. Um, we had a variety of surrounding land use. Um, we had both asphalt and concrete uh, wearing courses, and we had a variety of development densities from urban to suburban to rural, okay? Um, so this is a very busy slide, but I'm gonna walk you through it quickly here. Um, we've got the sites in the first column, the county they're located in, and the rainfall zone. Um, and then we had a bunch of different sort of predictor variables here that we were interested in looking at. So what type of surface, wearing surface do we have, what type of pavement, uh, what type of functional class, we had a variety of annual average daily traffic from about 8,000 vehicles per day to a maximum of 132,000 vehicles per day, so really a wide variety there. Um, catchment areas between uh, 0.1 and 0.4 acres to each of the catch basins that we monitored. Um, different adjacent land uses as well as different development densities, urban, suburban, and rural. One of these sites, the I-71 site, was not monitored for gross solids. The other 11 were. Uh, this was simply uh, mainly a safety issue. We couldn't find a, a catch basin that was safe to monitor on that particular section of the road. Okay, so in terms of the particle size distribution and TSS side of things, how did we sample for um, these, these, uh, these factors? Um, we monitored six sites in 2016 and six in 2017. Um, we monitored concentrated gutter flow, which then flowed into catch basins. We used runoff proportional sampling um, using samplers that I'll show you in just a second, automated samplers. And we measured rainfall at each site using a tipping bucket rain gauge um, so that we had rainfall on a one minute interval. We could really characterize the hiatus graph quite well. Um, here's our monitoring setup uh, at one of our sites. So this is a weir that we installed at State Route 48 in Dayton. Um, so in this case, it's a 45 degree weir. Um, in other cases, it was different, different geometries of weir depending on what expected flow rates we had to the site. Uh, we have a sample intake here at the top, um, which is where the samples are actually sucked through um, when the sampler pulls a vacuum on the tubing. Um, let me highlight this for the folks at home. Um, so here's our sample intake here. So the water sucked through this metal sample intake up through this tubing that you can see here and up to our sampler. And then we also have a pressure transducer that's located here that's hard to see, um, that's measuring the water level over this weir. And then using standard weir equations, we can convert uh, that water level to flow rate and then integrate to calculate flow volume over on the hydrograph. And we forced all the flow, I should mention, we forced all the flow behind the weir using an awning so that we were able to be um, assured that we measured all of the flow volume from the, the hydrograph. Okay, so um, the, the sampling was triggered on a flow proportional basis. So every 50 cubic feet, for example, it would take a sample and it would pour the sample into these bottles that you see in the second picture from the left um, in the bottom of the sampler. Um, we did isolate roadway drainage only, so we were sure to not pick sites that were adjacent to a quarry or that had a eroding hill slope draining onto the road. Um, so it was only roadway drainage. Um, only ODOT maintained roads, um, so that, that limited our, our choices as well. And then a variety of road characteristics, as I mentioned uh, earlier. We sampled 176 storms across 2016 and 2017 at the 12 sites, so quite a few, between 12 and 18 storms per monitoring site. Um, we characterized particle size distribution using laser diffraction particle counter, which is a, a 
piece of equipment that basically flashes a laser through the particles, um, and based on how that laser beam bounces back, you can figure out how large the particles are in the water. And this reports particle size between basically very, very small, the smallest end of clays at 0 0.04 micrometers up to the largest ends of sands at 2,000 micrometers. And it does so, I think, in 119 bins of particle size between that smallest and the largest um, diameters. Um, we did these analyses on event mean concentrations um, for each storm. So the sampler would obtain samples throughout the event. Here's an example of the samples in the right-hand picture um, on the slide. And you can see that the beginning of the event, just visually, is, is quite dirty, as you'd expect, right? The first flush of, of sediment. And then as the event continues, here's the six bottles for this particular event, we get sort of cleaner and cleaner water towards the end of the, the event. So we, what we do is we dump those all into one uh, compositing bottle, and then from that compositing bottle we sample into the laboratory bottle so we can get an event mean concentration of um, sediment and particle size distribution. Okay, so just some quick calculations. We did calculate loading of TSS. Um, for each storm event, so in a pound per acre uh, unit. Uh, that was related to the event mean concentration that I just talked about, uh, multiplied by the volume of runoff, which we measured using the weird pressure transducer. Um, and then we normalized by catchment area, because of course catchment area is going to play a significant role in how much volume comes off of the road. Uh, so that's how we calculated load on an event by event basis. And then we use this load in the next equation um, to calculate the annual load. So basically scaling up all of our monitored storms to an annual load because we don't sample every single storm in the year. Um, and this was done uh, by basically taking the equation from the last slide, dividing by the monitoring period duration. So we had roughly uh, usually about 10 months of data. Um, and then multiplying by uh, the average annual rainfall from the nearest uh, weather station basically at an airport and dividing by um, how much rainfall that we actually sample. So that was the way that we scaled up to a pounds per acre per sort of typical year um, of setup. And that again is a mass calculation, so we're in pounds now. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you a number of box plots that look like this. This is all of the rainfall data for the PSD and TSS sampled events. The different colors are the different sites, so all the sites have a different color. Um, and on the x-axis, we have rainfall depth, rainfall duration, peak intensity, average intensity, and antecedent dry period, or how long it's been since the last rainfall event. All I want to say here is that there's quite a bit of variability in all of these parameters, right? So we've got, it's not like we just monitor really short dry period storms or really long dry period storms. There's a lot of variability, which is what you want to see in a data set. Um, for rainfall depth, what I really want to focus in on is we monitored small storms down to around 0.1 inches and very large storms up, I think the maximum was 3.76 inches. So we got a good range of storm events. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the box plot, um, these are all box plots. And I just want to familiarize you really quickly. Uh, this middle line is the median value here. Um, this line is the 25th percentile. And this one is the 75th percentile here. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of the range of the typical um, rainfall depths and, and other rainfall parameters here. I don't want to spend too much time on that. I want to move forward. Uh, okay, so this is uh, our variability in particle size distribution. This is kind of a take-home slide. This is all 176 measured particle size distributions in one figure, okay? Um, and so if you want to look at a median value or kind of a middle, middle particle size distribution, it's just that black line here that passes through all of these. And all of these are separate box plots. Each one of these red um, vertical lines here are, um, are actually separate box plots. So this is one. And these are all the different bins that the, um, the laser diffraction unit can measure. Uh, so what I want to say here is that if we look at the clay, the silt, and the sand, there's not a lot of variability in clay. Uh, there's relatively similar amount of clay in all the samples that we collected. There's quite a, very, a lot of variability in the salt and sand fractions. Um, so there's in some cases a lot more sand, some cases a lot more silt, um, depending on the particular uh, sample. And that's really denoted by how wide the, uh, the error bars are on each, on each uh, box plot. Okay. So two things that are important here, or maybe most important, are the D50, or the median particle diameter. Um, that was 52 and a half micrometers across all of the sampled events. 
Again, that 75 micrometer threshold is really where hydrodynamic separators start to remove um, sediment. And then the D20 is also important because if you were to design for 80% removal, that D20 might be your design variable, right? Everything larger than that, um, if you were to remove everything larger than that, you would have 80% removal. So that was 22 micrometers um, in, in the sort of the median um, particle size that we measured. Okay, simplifying things a little bit and looking at percent sand, salt, and clay in, in the average samples by site. Um, what you can see is that for sand here, for all the sites on the on sort of the uh, first row, um, between roughly 40% and 65% of the sediment was the sand size fraction. So that's the easiest particulates to remove, right? Relatively short hydraulic retention time, as we talked about earlier. Percent silt ranged from uh, roughly 30 to 65% um, in each of the, the sites' uh, particulate matter. Um, and so this is more of a moderate hydraulic retention time, as we mentioned, 30 minutes to a few hours. And then clays were a relatively small proportion of the total um, sediment in the runoff. We had between 2 and 10%, roughly, of the total. So um, that's kind of nice to see as far as DMPs, because this is really, you've, at this point, you've moved to filtration, right? You've moved to the most expensive technologies. Um, I'm going to move through these kind of quickly, uh, but just want to show you a few examples of how um, different predictor variables affected PSD. So this is um, clay, silt, and sand uh, from left to right, as we've been doing for all these graphs. Um, and in this case, we're actually looking at land use, so surrounding land use, um, surrounding the road. What you can see is these green dots tend to be shifted to the right um, from the other three land uses, and those are the low-density residential sites. Um, and for whatever reason, um, the, all of the different particle diameters from the smallest to the largest um, were larger uh, or, or coarser in the low density residential than they were for the other three land uses. Um, similar trends were found for functional class. So for whatever reason, principal arterials were, uh, had coarser sediment size than interstates or minor arterials. <coughs> Don't ask me why. I'm not sure, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, the other thing I want to point out as I move through these three graphs is if you look at the D90s, for instance, these are different. The principal arterials are bigger, um, but they're not like five times bigger, right? They're just slightly bigger. So we're able to show it statistically, but I'm not sure that substantially it's, and there's any difference as to how you would actually treat this runoff, if that makes sense. The one thing I can explain is that we had um, significantly larger summer particle diameters than we did in spring and fall. And that was directly related, we think, to um, significantly greater rainfall intensity in the summer with the convective thunderstorms that we had in the summertime, just moving larger particulate matter. Um, so I think that makes um, some good sense. We didn't see any difference across um, urban, suburban, and rural. And concrete versus asphalt, there was no effect either um, across the study. Um, I'm going to show a couple of graphics like this. This is um, Spearman's rank correlation coefficients. So these are basically a visual way of looking at what's related to one another. Um, so where you see a blank square, there's no relationship between those parameters. So for instance, between the median part of the diameter and annual average daily traffic, we didn't see any relationship. Okay? The larger the circle, the bigger, the, the greater the relationship. Okay. So, for instance, for our different particle sizes here, from D10 up to D90, so from the smallest to the largest particles, we saw they were negatively correlated with TSF. So, in other words, as your particle size gets larger, your TSS concentrations tended to decrease. Um, TSS and particle size distribution were not really well correlated to rainfall or site characteristics, um, so that was interesting. So, things like depth and duration and intensity of rainfall um, were not well correlated to our particle size parameters. Okay. All right, uh, moving on to uh, TSS concentrations by site. This is a pretty important one, right? Trying to understand how much sediment comes off of a road in um, an untreated runoff type of case. Um, so these are the 12 sites here across the x-axis. Um, and what you can see is the average concentration is here in this dotted line. That was 35 milligrams per liter across the, the 12 sites. So relatively clean runoff for those of you who know um, the range of typical road runoff concentrations of TSS. I do want to mention three sites in particular, SR 257, State Route 81, and US 20. Uh, those three were um, sort of 
they had more sediment um, than the other uh, nine sites. Um, and if you move here from concentration to load in the next slide, and these are the box plots are in the same order, you can see that 257, SR81, and US20 had the highest loads. So not surprising, right? Higher concentrations. We have similar hydrologic responses. These are all small, 100% impervious catchments, right? Um, so higher concentrations are going to lead to higher loads. Not a shocker. The take-home point from this particular slide that I want to hit on is that the average CSS load was 242 pounds per acre per year. So if you have an acre watershed over an annual basis of road, we, we saw on average 242 pounds of sediment. Okay? Um, that number is going to be important as we, as we move through the rest of the talk. Um, so just some take-homes here on CSS and PSD. Um, the D50 was 52 micrometers. The D20 was 22 micrometers. Um, we did see the surrounding land use, functional class, and season all affected PSD, but the differences were small, and so we don't expect that there would be any difference in BMP design, best management practice design, based on these differences in PSD. Mean TSS concentrations were 35 milligrams per liter. Okay, so those are your take-homes on TSS and PSD. All right, for gross solids, how did we actually sample the gross solids? We built a, uh, basically a mesh netting with a frame, as you can see here. Um, in the catch basin, so it was dropped down into an existing catch basin, um, and we basically built a small flow diverter, um, which we put in the gutter right here, um, which we built out of a two by four, um, and basically forced all of the water into um, the grate here as opposed to going through the throat of the inlet. Okay, so we, we were basically capturing all of the uh, gross solids in our netting um, that's underneath that grate. We visited the sites to sample on average every 11.6 days, um, and all accumulated debris and trash was removed and taken to the lab for analysis. Um, so you can imagine big garbage bags, essentially. Um, 202 samples were collected at the 11 sites, between 14 and 22 samples per site, and we had a good uh, variety across spring, summer, and fall um, samples, most in the summer uh, for what that's worth. We characterized wet weight uh, just basically with a scale um, and then volume. So we measured uh, the depth of samples in known containers um, so that we could get a bulk volume of, um, of gross solids. And then we also, um, using some intrepid undergrads and tweezers, uh, separated out each of these samples into nine categories, uh, vegetation, cigarettes, plastic, wood, glass, metal, fabric, paper, which included uh, cardboard and gravel, okay? So kind of the nine things you'd expect to see. We also found dead birds, the dead squirrel, all kinds of good things that we didn't include in this, uh, this analysis that made things rather smelly, as you might imagine. Okay, um, looking at load calculations for this, so mass of um, gross solids per acre per day, um, we calculated that using the sum of the mass of each sampling event divided by the watershed area multiplied by the duration of the monitoring period. So a simple calculation, um, and we applied this calculation for volumetric loading rate as well, just with volumetric terms as opposed to mass. Rainfall characteristics, again, wide-ranging. Um, what I want to mention on rainfall depth here is that because we sampled every 11 days, often there were multiple rainfall events occurring in each sample. So the maximum was up around eight um, inches as opposed to 3.75 inches of rainfall over the sampling period. Okay. Um, these are the gross solids categories. So total volume is all the way on the left. Vegetation is adjacent to that. Cigarettes, plastic, glass, metal, wood, fabric, gravel, paper, in that order. Um, and what you can see is for some of these categories like glass and metal, there's not very many dots. And that's because there was no glass or metal in that sample, okay, in, in a number of those samples. So the, the dots are only shown when there was actually that particular category in the sample. The other thing you'll note is that the vegetation and the total volume match up quite well. They, are, they kind of overlap. And that's because vegetation was accounted for the vast majority of gross solids volume. So between 63 and 95 percent of the gross solids volume was vegetation at a particular site. All of the other categories were basically less than 15% um, of the, the gross solids volume. This is just looking at it in a different way, a stacked bar plot here. The different colors are the different categories, okay? 
the green is vegetation, so um, that was the most common uh, contributor to gross solids volume at all 11 sites that we monitored. Uh, the second most common were cigarettes, plastic, and gravel. Um, and then the third most common, cigarettes, plastic, wood, gravel, and paper. So it kind of gives you a rough idea of what's coming off of the road uh, here in Ohio. We looked at seasonal differences across um, gross solids volume, and we did see significant seasonality uh, for total volume, vegetation, and cigarettes, with the fall having more than spring and summer. Um, and same thing for plastic, um, and I, we think that's related mainly to leaf drop in the autumn. Um, and then a lot of what we saw is a lot of the other pollutants like cigarettes and plastic gets kind of accumulated in the leaf drop um, and then conveyed to the storm sewer network. Um, so that's why we think we see plastic there um, in the fall. And I, don't, I don't think there's more littering in the fall, for instance, um, but we, again, we think that's related to leaf drop. All right, um, predictors of gross solids volume, I'm not gonna, um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna move through this um, in depth, but I will say that what we found was that Antecedent, uh, sorry, uh, annual average daily traffic correlated to total volume of gross solids, vegetation, plastic, and cigarettes. So I think that um, probably does speak to things like um, how many car accidents are occurring, how, you know, how much littering might be occurring, might be involved in that, um, just greater number of cars. Rainfall depth and duration um, were correlated to total volume of plastic. So if you had more rainfall, you had more gross solids, kind of makes sense. That's, that's your wash off portion of the equation. And then your last time since the previous sample or how long the buildup of pollutants was occurring was also a factor. So um, that's again, the buildup side of the equation that is probably not all that surprising either. We use multiple linear regression to look at um, characterizing urban versus suburban versus rural sites. And this was by far the most obvious trend um, out of all the data. On average, four times more total gross solids volume per sampling event at urban sites than rural or suburban. So if you're ODOT and you're trying to maintain your catch basins, the urban sites are clearly where I'd be spending my money. Um, that's, that was a big take home from this particular study. Similar trends were observed for vegetation. Cigarettes and plastic were two times more at urban sites than rural sites. So there was a lot of trends here showing that urban was greater than, than non-urban essentially. Okay, if we look at gross solids mass by category, um, we saw similar trends where uh, vegetation at all but one site was the vast majority of the total mass of gross solids coming off of the roads. Um, one site did have 65% gravel, um, and that was related to um, pavement wear essentially, um, so larger gravels. I'll show you. I'll show you that in just a second. Um, so this is the same stacked bar plot. Um, you can see the State Route 117 site in Lima had a lot of gravel um, in its total mass. So uh, vegetation at 10 of the sites was the most common gross solids mass contributor and gravel um, at State Route 117. And then you can see the, the sort of second most common and third most common contributors there. I'm not gonna move through them, but you can see it's a wide variety of, of uh, other uh, gross solids categories. In terms of seasonality of mass, um, we did see that total mass and vegetation was greater in the fall than in the summer, again related to uh, leaf drop. Um, gravel, across all the sites we saw spring was greater than fall and summer was greater than fall. So essentially, the closer you are to winter, the more gravel there was. And I think that may be related to winter maintenance in terms of plowing, and then also freeze thaw and its effects on the pavement, just causing more um, particulate matter to be on the, the pavement surface. Um, in terms of gross solid mass, we saw less correlation uh, with rainfall and site parameters. So rainfall depth and duration um, were weakly correlated to uh, total mass, vegetation, and cigarettes. Um, site characteristics were not well correlated to gross solid mass for, for, what, uh, for what that's worth. Okay, looking again at this urban versus suburban and rural trend, Using multiple linear regression, um, this is again the most significant uh, thing that we found. On average, 12 times higher gross solids uh, mass from urban than suburban or rural sites. So two and a half pounds per sample versus less than two tenths of a pound per sample for the suburban and rural sites. Um, so those trends are, are really um, kind of in flashing bold lights, pretty, pretty uh, obvious to see. 
The final thing we looked at for ghost solids was moisture content. Um, so this is related to landfilling, right? If we want to landfill these things after we factor them out of the catch basin, uh, the typical moisture content that's optimal for landfilling to get good compaction and not and have good slope stability is 60 to 70 percent. Um, we measured moisture content for 30 out of the 202 samples that we collected by oven drying and found um, moisture content varied between 10 and 440 percent. So uh, for about a third of the samples, uh, we were substantially higher than the 60 to 70 percent. So there may be some cases where we're going to be doing some decanting, dewatering operations after we um, factor these gross solids out. So take homes for gross solids, uh, the autumn season, a particularly high maintenance load. Uh, so you can see one of our catch basin inserts here completely full. This is a catch basin that we were monitoring that's full to the brim with five feet of, of leaves. Um, so it, it does happen and it's going to happen most frequently in this time of the year. Um, mowing was another one. So we saw this a lot where we had grass kind of accumulating and obviously getting through the grade as well. Um, so but directly after mowing might be another time where street sweeping, if you're trying to optimize the street sweeping. Uh, doing that directly after mowing may, be, um, may have some value to it as well. So gross solid summary, uh, vegetation was by far the largest contributor to mass and volume, urban greater than suburban or rural, um, and autumn the highest for vegetation are really the big um, take homes there. Okay, um, so what we want to do now is apply all these data to our manufactured treatment devices. Um, so the goals here were really to determine which MTDs meet 80% TSS removal. Um, then try to understand what are the costs for these systems. So how much do they cost to purchase, how much do they cost to install, and what are the long-term O&M um, needs, and what are those costs. Um, and then what TSS removal can we expect um, from these systems based on the data that we just collected and I just showed you. Um, and, and then a cost-benefit analysis for these, um, for these systems compared to, um, yeah, for, for all these systems. That's all I want to say. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, most manufacturer treatment device um, testing is completed in a laboratory setting. These are set based on New Jersey DEP standards, and you can find the guidance here if you'd like to get further information. The, the uh, website is, is given there. Um, and the lab testing is done um, with a couple of simplifications uh, based on comparing to real storm events. So first is a constant flow rate, so there's no rising limb, peak, and falling limb to the hydrograph like you'd see in a, in a real storm. And the second one is uh, a relatively high TSS concentration of 200 milligrams per liter. Again, our average was 35 milligrams per liter, so quite a bit cleaner uh, than the water that's put through these tests. Uh, what I will say with the testing is the particle size distribution, as I'll show you in just a second, was quite similar to what we measured in the field. Um, so that part of the equation is, um, is, is good. Um, so in terms of approved manufacturer treatment devices, there's a number of them that are out there that have been through this laboratory testing. Um, for 50% TSS removal, the vast majority of them are hydrodynamic separators, as we mentioned earlier. For 80% TSS removal, um, they're either these filtration vault technologies, these underground vaults with uh, filters in them, or high flow um, filters, which are similar to Filtera, if you all are familiar with those, of basically bioretention in a concrete box with a plant coming out of it. Um, and it has a very high flow media, maybe 100 inch per hour um, saturated hydraulic conductivity. Okay, so in terms of basically what we want to do is figure out, do these percent removals make sense? Well, if our particle size distribution in the field is similar to the NJCAT distributions, so the New Jersey testing distributions, then we would say typically yes, right? So what do those two look like compared to one another? Um, the NJCAT distribution shown in red here and our particle size distribution that we measured uh, here in Ohio is, is uh, in blue. What you can see is these two um, track quite well, one against the other. Uh, they're relatively similar. Um, RD50 is a little bit, um, a little bit smaller, uh, 52 compared to 75. Uh, but for instance, the D20, which is what we might be most interested in for 80% TSS removal, ours is 22, as I mentioned, and NJCAT's is actually eight. So the testing, if you're testing down for a system that's gonna get 80% removal, down to eight micrometers, that's actually conservative for what we measured, right? Because our particle size is, is almost three times larger for that D20 value, okay? So pretty uh, happy with that. All right, so looking at the cost, um, we contacted six manufacturers. We got data back from three of those. 
Uh, for purchase installation and maintenance costs, so I basically ask them what are the typical costs across the country. Give us a wide range, you know, give us your, your roughly your middle value. For hydrodynamic separators, underground filter vaults, and high flow media filters, and we ask them for various sizes of each of those so that we could get a range of um, watershed areas that different models of these would treat essentially. We determined approximate drainage area treated for each device using the rational method. So Q peak equals C times I times A. Um, our C value was 0.9, which is typical for uh, a road. I was 1.85 inches per hour, which is the new um, standard that ODOT is using for these manufactured treatment devices. And Q is the certified flow rate that's certified through the laboratory testing, the NJCAT <coughs> laboratory testing. Okay, so the only value left in that is A, which is what we were solving for in that equation, the area that these systems could treat. So this is the type of data that we collected and, and brought together. So this is for hydrodynamic separators. I'm showing data from Contact and Old Castle here. Uh, the models are on the left, so those are different sizes of these devices. Um, the top are the smallest ones, and then moving down are, get larger and larger. Uh, your drainage area that we calculated using the rational method is shown here in the second column. Um, and then in the fourth column, we start to look at costs. Okay, so first is what does it cost me to actually buy this device that I'm going to stick in the ground? Then what does it cost me to stick it in the ground? And then what does it cost me on an annual basis to actually make sure that the system is going to function in the long term, which we assumed was 30 years. Okay, so then we calculated the 30 year uh, per acre cost. So um, we took the drainage area and factored that in. And as you can see, as you get larger and larger drainage areas, your per acre cost goes down substantially by like a factor of three here. Of course, the cost, just the number, uh, as you get a bigger and bigger drainage area, your, your cost is going to increase, right? You've got a bigger device to treat that, that particular drainage area. So um, this is the type of data that we brought together for hydrodynamic separators, for filter vault, and for high flow filters. Okay. We then calculated return on investment using three different drainage areas, 0 0.5, 2, and 10 acres, so kind of smallest one that we think ODOT might have to the, maybe the largest um, possible for these manufactured treatment devices. We utilized the NJCAP certified TSS removal rates of either 50 or 80 percent um, in the calculations. We used the measured TSS load of 242 pounds per acre per year from this study in the calculation. Um, we chose the solution with the lowest 30-year cost. Um, so that could be one or multiple BMPs. It could be one or, you know, I think in one case there was like 35 high flow filters for a 10 acre watershed. Um, and then compared all of these using the annual cost per pound of sediment removed as our, our um, way to look at return on investment essentially. So here's the, the calculations for the half acre drainage area. Um, we've got the different types of manufactured treatment devices in the first column here. Uh, there are percent removals based on the NJCAT testing, and we'll talk about those a little bit further later in the presentation. The measured TSS load that we measured from our sites here in Ohio. The chosen solutions, and as you can see, in some cases, there's multiple of a particular uh, BMP to get to that half-acre drainage area. What the 30-year cost would be, and then the amount of sediment that's removed to so either 50 or 80% of that 242 pounds per acre per year. And then from there, we get the annual cost of pound per pound of sediment removed. So as you can see, the cheapest hydrodynamic separator is around 21 pounds, um, $21 per pound. Um, and then the cheapest filtration-based unit, in this case, is about $37 per pound. So we're roughly doubling the cost, in this case, in the smallest drainage area. For a two-acre drainage area, we're moving from just under $10 per pound of sediment removed to the cheapest um, filtration-based system was around 32 pounds per, um, dollars per pound, excuse me. Um, I'm not going to show you the two acre uh, data, or sorry, 10 acre data, um, because there's similar trends here, but what I'm going to summarize this with is, is um, that all the BMPs get cheaper as watershed area increases on a cost per pound of sediment removed basis. I think that makes sense. Costs to move from filtri to filtration from hydrodynamic separation are roughly two to four X um, in terms of total cost um, per pound of sediment removed. And they're more than that if you're looking at just flat dollars um, so they're more like five to ten times higher if you're just looking at my actual cost, okay? Um, as a, not as a function of sediment removed. So, yeah, we can come back to that if that didn't make sense. All right, so um, the question then is, do these percent removals, um, do they translate from the laboratory testing into the field, 
Okay. And I'm going to preface this whole discussion by we did not do any field testing of hydrodynamic separators in this project. Okay. Um, but we, there are data that are out there, so we need to review them. So the Table 4 practices approved for 80% TSS removal. Um, they're, they're out there, right? Ponds, wetlands, bioretention, porous pavement, et cetera. Uh, basically, if your influent concentration of TSS is less than 100 milligrams per liter for these devices, you have to show that your effluent is going to be less than 20 milligrams per liter or, or lower. Um, in this case, our influent to a, to a BMP would be 35 milligrams per liter. That's the mean number that we collected. Um, and so basically the question is, at this concentration, do the lab testing results translate to the field? So where I always go first for these types of studies is the International Stormwater BMP database. This is a large database of field monitoring studies from across the U.S. So there's a good geographic range. Um, there's over 700 BMP studies performed by researchers like myself as well as municipalities and sewer districts and others. And the folks that run it report out roughly every three to five years on performance summaries. The last one for manufactured treatment devices is admittedly about a half a decade old. Um, you can find that at bmpdatabase.org if you're interested. I'm going to excerpt some of those data here. Uh, this is TSS performance on the y-axis, so TSS concentration on the y-axis, and different types of manufactured treatment devices on the x-axis. Um, and I'm going to highlight filtration first. So this would be like an underground filter vault or a high flow filter. Um, what you can see, inlet on the left and in blue, and outlet on the right in green within my, within my box. Um, what you can see is that there's substantial removal of sediment um, in this case from about 40 milligrams per liter median coming in to um, about 12 or 13 milligrams per liter coming out. Um, if we look at hydrodynamic separators, which are now outlined here, um, there's really not much difference between the inlet median and inlet, or sorry, outlet median concentrations. Um, so this is about 400 paired event mean concentrations across 22 different field studies of hydrodynamic separators. So there's a lot of hydrodynamic separators that were studied um, across the country for this, this data set. Um, and this was a roughly a 12% reduction um, from inlet to outlet, which was not significantly different from zero. Um, so yeah, so that's the number that is in, the, um, in this large database of um, field studies of hydrodynamic separators. So if we look at this as a, on a concentration basis, just number TSS in, TSS out, you can see there are four different types of manufactured treatment devices that get below that 20 milligram per liter threshold. Um, for hydrodynamic separators, we have a 33.6 milligram per liter inlet concentration and roughly 30 milligrams per liter coming out. And this is an extremely similar inflow concentration to what we measured, right? We measured 35. Um, so we're within like one milligram per liter of what's in this database. Um, so kind of interesting to see there. Um, last slide here, uh, this is some data that was collected by a couple different studies. I'm going to start out with Ferreira and Stenstrom. Um, they looked at three different types of BMPs, hydrodynamic separation, dry detention basins, so giant hole in the ground essentially, and wetlands. And what you can see is they looked at different fractions of particle size, so uh, small particles up to very large particles here. I'm going to do this on here so they can understand as well. Um, so from small particles here up to very large particles, again, small particles to large, small particles to large, and they looked at the percent removal of TSS across each of these bins of particle size, okay? Um, and so you can see here, again, the 75 micrometer number that I mentioned earlier for hydrodynamic separators, they found exactly the same thing, that there's not much removal at all below that. Um, and so these data were paired with some data that Francis Charters collected um, in New Zealand for road runoff. This is uh, D50 of 70 micrometers, so it's a little bit coarser than the data that we collected. Um, a little bit larger particle sizes. Um, and what she found for TSS removals, modeling the data using these categories was 12 to 15% removal for hydrodynamic separators, which by the way is in that exact same range as what we saw in the stormwater BMP database on the last slide, uh, roughly 90% and 95% for dry detention and wetlands respectively. If we use our measured PSD in this study and run them through these exact same filters of particle size, uh, we get 13% removal for hydrodynamic separators, which again is in the same range and in the same range of the stormwater BMP database, um, and roughly 90 and 97% removal for the larger detention based systems. So, with that said, um, the 10 to 15% removal of TSS that we see in field studies wouldn't get us all the way to that 20 milligram per liter um, effluent concentration that we need. 
Okay, so just closing thoughts here. Uh, PSC and TSS were measured in 176 different real storm events. Mean concentrations were 35 milligrams per liter of TSS. Um, the PSDs were similar to the NJCAP distribution, so the lab testing for the distribution of particle sizes, I think, is, is, is right on. Um, hydrodynamic separators generally remove sediment greater than 75 micrometers, so kind of your sands and your grits. Um, I have some concerns as to whether the NJCAP testing is representative of real field conditions based on the entire literature review that we did um, in this study. In terms of gross solids, um, there were highly variable um, amounts of gross solids coming off of the roads. So every roughly 12 days, we saw between a quarter of a gallon and 20 gallons of gross solids, uh, between 0.1 pounds and 62 pounds um, over that same period in terms of mass. Uh, vegetation was most common, and so that relates back to maintenance, both um, street sweeping after mowing as well as in the autumn um, when leaf drops occurring, I think is really going to be key. Final slide, um, comparing now our average TSS loading rate of 242 pounds per acre per year and our average gross solids loading rate of 150 pounds per acre per year, TSS represents about 62% of the total solids in our measured runoff. Um, about 38% of it is, is the gross solid, uh, so sort of interesting. With that, I'm a few minutes over, but I think we have some time, hopefully, for questions. Apologize for going over a few minutes. We will open it up to questions now in the room and online. So we'll start within the room. And if you're online, you can type your question in the chat box, or you know, when I get to that point, I will open it up for you to verbally speak. So in the room, any questions or comments? So Ryan, it sounded like a really thorough study. Just to clarify, do you have any concerns that, that we missed any big pockets of data? You know, I know we didn't get winter, but uh, you know, we have sites all over the place. We have a lot of different seasons. Yeah. As far as the other studies that are out there, 176 samples seems like a lot. It's a lot. So can you it's, compare the thoroughness of this to maybe what else is out there? Sure. I would say it's on the very thorough end of what's out there. Um, most other studies are, you know, typically looking at two or three or four sites and maybe 10 or 12 samples, so you've got 30 or 40 points to draw from as opposed to four times that here. Um, this is the best gross solids data set that I know of for road sites. I don't know of any others that are more thorough than this. Um, so yeah, I think we. Like I showed you with the rainfall data, we really got a wide variety of different events. Some were really intense, some were you know, more spring, April rains where it rained for a couple days straight. Um, we, we did not characterize the winter just because that's a heck of a lot harder with automated samplers and frankly most of the time it's snow and we're plowing that off of the road anyway. So it's sort of, if you're plowing it off of the right of way and it's not going in the catch basin anyway, I think that's sort of a moot point. Um, so I, I think that weakness maybe is not as weak as, as some people might say in this particular case because it's roads. Yeah. And I had another question. So the, the, we talked about the 242 pounds per year, per acre per year of, from TSS mm -hmm. solids mm -hmm. and the 150 or so pounds, 150 yeah, pounds yeah. per acre per year from gross solids. So we're probably assuming, is it correct that we're probably assuming that most hydrodynamic separators or more advanced you know, filtration units would probably get most of the gross solids out? 90, 80, 90 percent. And when, when you were comparing treatment efficacy before, you were, we were just talking about TSS. Correct. Not, not any of the gross solids. Correct. We, we have done the calculations, including the gross solids as well. And... Oh, my battery's running low. I apologize. Um, and I would I don't want to misspeak right now, um, but I think it was in the range of uh, it made hydrodynamic separators slightly cheaper per pound of sediment removed. So it was in the range of two and a half to five instead of two to four x increase in cost. Make sense. Sure. I, mean, I know gross solids aren't in Ohio a regulated pollutant, so right. might not be much point. But but there's still benefit to removing them, right? Right. Um, right. Sure. Well, along with the benefit, is there the drawback? And now you're losing volume for sediment capture. Are you increasing your cost of maintenance, having 
those insert bags full of vegetation in your separator? Um, so I I don't necessarily know that I want to comment because we didn't actually collect any physical data on hydrodynamic separators here. Um, and so I, my level of hydrodynamic separator knowledge is not maybe up to where I would be able to give you a full answer on that. Um, certainly the trash, you know, and NJCAT testing doesn't include trash, right? So that's a big difference that I didn't mention as well. Um, certainly you have to maintain them in order to get long-term functionality, and that's true of any any BMP, be it manufacturer treatment device or by retention cell, um, right? If you, if you don't have maintenance in the long term, yeah. So what we've seen is anywhere between one and four times per year basically factoring out these hydrodynamic separators is what I've seen from inspection and maintenance reports from different areas of Ohio that I tried to bring together for the third portion of this, uh, the last portion of this study, the literature review, um, as a rough estimate of maintenance needs. Other questions? I have a question from Kevin here at ODOT. Sure. Is volume of gross solids typically used as an input to the design of MTDs or is mass mm -hmm. used? That's a good question. So um, <clears throat> I would say generally neither is really used for the design of MTDs and it's really not used for the design of BMPs in general. It probably should be. Um, so there's, the, I think there's some definite impacts to things like four bay design or other pretreatment design that could be informed by these data. Um, so for instance, you know, right now we use at best rules of thumb for how big a four bay should be as compared to a wetland or pond or whatever. Um, and, and so you could design it using these data to understand, you know, how long is it going to take to fill up? Um, what, what's my what's the maintenance interval that I'm okay with taking on as ODOT, right? Um, those are the types of questions that we could answer with these data. Now, ODOT's spec, specification for manufacturer treatment devices, supplemental specification 985, does make the submitter list the sediment storage capacity of each unit. It is, there's not a minimum for its criteria, but if ODOT, when we we're deciding which ones to allow on the qualified products list, if we saw one that said, you know, one cubic foot sediment storage capacity, there's a good chance we wouldn't allow that to be on the QPL, um, just because it would need to be maintained so frequently. So we didn't inform it directly yet, but I think there are places we could go with these data to inform the for Ohio. So you're, uh, you're loading uh, yes, a solid and a, a smaller particle. How does that compare to the almost, in my mind, it would be another column on your table mm -hmm. for each manufacturer's device. Is there a maintenance frequency that's suggested by what you found? Yeah, so in the cost, uh, I'm just going to move back a few slides here. Apologize. Um, in the cost, um, I'm just going to move back a few more slides. In this cost table, um, so this is just for hydrodynamic separators. Um, this annualized maintenance cost was for one maintenance event per year, which was the typical recommendation that I found if I took kind of the average across all of the manufacturer's recommendations, that was the typical. For filtration vault technologies, um, they tend to be bigger in surface area than the hydrodynamic separators for a given design flow rate. Um, and because they're bigger, they have more storage for sediment, and so they, their average recommendation was about every four years for major maintenance. Um, that major maintenance is much more complex than for a hydrodynamic separator. For a hydrodynamic separator, it's dropping the boom down in, vacuuming everything out. For the filtration vaults, it's doing that, so it's sucking out all the accumulated sediment and water, but it's also changing out the filters, um, so, sw so swapping those out. Um, and then for the high flow filters, so the filtera type devices, uh, Biopod, another one that's out there, um, those are twice per year, um, and that's because they're small, they're you know, 25 square feet or what have you, that's mainly hand tools, replacing mulch, um, removing trash, pruning vegetation, relatively simple stuff. Um, so all of those maintenance costs were annualized um, in the calculation and then scaled by a factor of 30 to get to the... So 
But you, you uh, monitored something that would be good to check whether that annual maintenance is enough, too much, based on the load. I mean, I'm it's a good course way to look at it, but uh, if you took the, the volume captured and the volume at when your sediment reaches its volume, it would be a good way to actually assess, you know, what people are putting in their own implants. Is that enough or is that too much? How much does it fill up a typical unit? Yeah, it's using like using those rates that you actually monitor. Right. Um, to the monitor. Agreed. We have not done that calculation. <laughs> yeah. But agreed. So much data available to do whatever we want. Yeah. Other questions in the room or online? If you'd like to. Ask your question on the phone. Feel free to unmute and do so. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, everyone, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a great project to work on. All right. The presentation has been recorded and will be available with the final report and fact sheet on the ODOT research website in a couple weeks. And thank you for attending.